So welcome to the MSK Science Spotlight. I'm Kevon Kishari, and uh, today this uh, seminar series features lectures from leaders in basic and translational biomedical science. Uh, so just to give you information on how this works, we have questions that can come through during the talk. You can email them to the Office of Scientific Education and Training at oset at mskcc.org or by tweeting at MSK Education. Uh, we'll answer those questions at the end of the program. Uh, it's just some technical information for the best viewing experience. Please use Google Chrome. If you're using Internet Explorer, please use version 11 or higher. Uh, if you experience technical issues during the live stream, please lower the video resolution. That should help. And you can do that by clicking on the gear shift on the lower right of the screen. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Luis Diaz, who's the head of the Division of Solid Tumor Oncology and the Greer Family Chair uh, at Sloan Kettering. And his talk today is entitled Immunotherapy of Mismatch Repair Deficient Tumors. And we're excited to hear uh, from Luis. So take it away. Thanks, Kayvon. Um, let me start with my disclosures. And I'm gonna begin um, with an outline of this talk. I, I rarely do this, but I'll do it for this purpose. Uh, I'll be talking about the immunotherapy uh, for mismatch repair deficient tumors. I'll start with some background, talk about the clinical effects of this approach, potential mechanisms of action, a summary of, of what we talked about, and then future applications. So we dive right into the background. So this story really began um, on the tales of the cancer genome projects that were initiated when I was at Johns Hopkins and then followed up by the TCGA. Um, and what was clear is there was a significant amount of heterogeneity in terms of the number of mutations that different tumor types had. For instance, liquid tumors and pediatric tumors had low number of mutations. Sporadic adult tumors had an intermediate amount of mutations. And mutagen-associated tumors had a varied amount of uh, mutations, whereas certain subsets of tumors like mismatch repair deficient tumors had an incredibly high number of mutations. And at the end of these cancer genome projects, what was clear was that there was a new era in terms of therapy, and that was checkpoint blockade therapy, or a type of immunotherapy that was having profound effects in melanoma and lung cancer. And this was in 2011 and 2012. And what we thought was, just maybe this might be related to the number of mutations that these tumors had. Um, and could we do a comparison between tumors that had a low number of mutations versus those that have an extraordinary high number of mutations like the mismatch pair deficient tumors and see if these checkpoint inhibitors had a profound response. So in 2012, we began hypothesizing around this idea. And I'll just give a little background as to what mismatch pair deficiency is and how that relates to microsatellite instability. There are two ways that you come to mismatch pair deficiency in humans. One is the hereditary form or Lynch syndrome, and the other is a sporadic form that occurs in, in patients with tumors um, randomly without any hereditary pretense. In the hereditary form, you have a germline mutation that you carry from generation to generation, and you are at risk that if you have a second mutation, in the opposite allele that you'll end up with mismatch pair deficiency. In the somatic form, you have an activation of two alleles, and that can be first from a sporadic somatic mutation, and oftentimes the second allele is hit uh, by both methylation or even occasionally by LOH inactivation. The hereditary form represents about 10 to 15% of mismatch pair deficient tumors. The sporadic form remains much higher, 85 to 90%. So if you have a cell that has DNA replications and mismatch repair, this ha results in the inability to recognize and repair spontaneous mutations and single base mismatches and short insertions and deletions. You have accumulation of these mutations and for some reason you get accumulation of altered microsatellite changes. This leads to microsatellite instability and an exceptionally high mutational burden, typically more than 50 mutations per megabase. And the type of mutations are accumulated are insertion and deletions. And this is important for what we'll talk about down the road in terms of mechanism of action. 
What was apparent was that these mismatched predeficient tumors were different histopathologically. Um, and this was work published by Stan Hamilton in the early 1990s, where he demonstrated, and this had been known for decades, that patients with mismatched predeficient tumors had a very strong lymphocytic infiltrate. So tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And this was so potent of a marker for the presence of mismatched rare deficiency that when a pathologist, let's say in a colon cancer and an mitral cancer saw a tumor that was densely infiltrated with lymphocytes, they could almost diagnose mismatched rare deficiency from the histopathology. Subsequent to that, um, virtually two decades later, uh, Drew Pardall and Nick Losa um, started looking at checkpoints on mismatched rare deficient tumors, and they found a profound upregulation in virtually all mismatch, uh, all checkpoints in mismatched rare deficient tumors compared to mismatched rare proficient tumor counterparts. Typically, these tumors happen in colon cancer, and you have mismatched rare deficient colon cancers and mismatched rare proficient colon cancers. And in comparing, you saw there was a not only a dense lymphocytic infiltrate, but much higher levels of checkpoints. So while we were conducting this study, two landmark papers came out. One in melanoma showed that tumor mutational burden was associated with a better response in melanoma to checkpoint blockade with CTLA-4. And also uh, work by Naya Rizvi, Matt Hellman, and Tim Chan showed that um, mutational burden also correlated with response to sensitivity to P1 blockade in non-small cell lung cancer. So given all this data and with the emerging, our emerging trial that was ongoing, um, this was the background and the hypothesis that the genomes of mismatched rare deficient tumor harbored thousands of mutations, which ex if expressed as protein could potentially be recognized by the immune system as foreign antigens. The abundance of these mutation or mutant associated new antigens uh, that are in mismatched rare deficient are enriched for frame shift mutations. These mismatched rare deficient tumors were highly inflamed with a dense lymphocytic infiltrate and high expressions of pd one So we hypothesize that treatment of these tumors with anti-PD-1 would unlock a potent anti-tumor response. So what happened when we tried this hypothesis? So we initiated the study in early 2013, um, and we designed it in the following way. First cohort was colorectal cancers with mismatched pair deficient tumors. The second cohort was colon cancers with mismatched pair proficient tumors, and then we had a third bucket, mismatched rare deficient tumors that were non-colorectal cancers. And we treated with a relatively high dose of anti-PD-1, in this case, pembrolizumab, at 10 milligrams per kilogram every two weeks. Um, and we only enrolled patients that had failed all standard of care therapies, whether that be in the colon cancer cohort or in the mismatched rare proficient cohort. And on the right, I can show you data that uh, just summarizing really quickly that we saw significant results. And this was an example of one such result. This is a patient that had a very large progressive colorectal cancer that was mismatched pair deficient. Um, the patient uh, received anti-PD-1 therapy and by week 20, they had had not only a partial response, but a major response, almost a complete response. And the tumor marker normalized after two doses. Um, and in our eyes, this was a pretty remarkable response. And, and this wasn't something that we saw just in this one case, but we saw in virtually every case where after the first dose, not only would we expect by week 20 to see a radiographic response, but we also saw a clinical response almost immediately. Patients who were in pain became pain-free. Patients who had symptomatology related to their tumor burden had an immediate response. And to us, that was uh, quite remarkable. When we looked at radiographic responses, in the green are the mismatched pair deficient tumors, and in the red are the proficient tumors. You can see these are colon cancers, and the one that were deficient, the majority responded, uh, and the proficient tumors progressed quite rapidly. And when we looked at progression-free survival, the proficient tumors, low mutational tumor burden, all progressed quite rapidly, with a median progression-free survival of 2.3 months, and the deficient group still has not had a reached uh, median uh, progression-free survival. The same is true with overall survival. Uh, our, our overall survival is not reached in the mismatch pair deficient group, but the proficient group did reach it at 5.98 months. More recently, <clears throat> we moved this from the advanced treatment refractory group 
to the first line in colon cancer, and we compared pembrolizumab alone versus standard of care, investigator choice, first line chemotherapy. Um, and the primary endpoint here was progression-free survival. 307 patients, all mismatch pair deficient, were randomized to pembrolizumab or chemotherapy. And what we saw was, again, looking at progression-free survival, quite, quite a dramatic difference. In the chemotherapy arm here uh, in the uh, purple-brown, you saw progression-free survival was much more rapid than that in the, in the uh, pembrolizumab-treated arm in the green, um, with a very significant not only hazard ratio, but also p-value. When we looked at the factors that impacted favorable response to, um, to pembrolizumab, everything was fairly even um, with a few exceptions. Uh, one was patients who harbored KRS or NRAS mutations favored chemotherapy over pembrolizumab. And um, that was surprising to us because everything else looked fairly uh, consistent. So the anti-tumor response in terms of response rate was fairly similar, 67% uh, versus, uh, excuse me, 43% versus 33%. Um, however, the complete response rate was 11% in the pembrolizumab arm and only 4% in the chemotherapy arm. So catching us up to this point, uh, the FDA approved pembrolizumab for adults and children patients with metastatic disease, um, actually regardless of tumor type, and I'll get to that data in a second, in parallel using an, another drug, nivolumab, in patients 12 years or older with metastatic colorectal cancer, the FDA approved this based on this work. Um, and based on this pool analysis, um, we began looking at tumor types beyond colorectal cancer. This is a study called Keynote 164 and 158, which combines the results from colorectal cancers and non-colorectal cancers treated with anti-PD-1 therapy. Um, there was virtually every tumor type represented here because mismatch pair deficiency can appear in virtually any tumor type, uh, most commonly colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer, gastric cancer, cholangiocarcinoma. Um, and what was found here was uh, quite encouraging. Um, a total of 357 patients were treated 124 were colorectal cancer patients, 233 were um, from every other tumor type. And what was impressive was not only was the response rate of 34% across all these tumor types impressive, but if you did have a response, the durability of that response uh, was quite impressive. Um, and that persisted and has persisted uh, to date. Overall survival was quite good as well, uh, with a median overall survival of 27.8 months. However, if you notice, this is not as good as what we found when we looked at colorectal cancer alone, at least in our initial study. And this is progression-free survival. Again, surprising that progression-free survival is quite short at four months. So what was driving that? So we started drilling down at the individual tumor types. And we were seeing very high responses with colorectal cancer, almost 60% with endometrial cancer, almost 50% with gastric cancer. But pancreatic cancer and brain cancers were exceedingly low. Pancreatic cancer was only at 19%. Brain tumors were 0%. So no brain tumors with mismatch rate deficiency showed a response. And only 20% of pancreatic cancers showed a response. When we looked at overall survival by tumor type, median overall survival is not reached for colorectal cancer. It was not reached for endometrial cancer. It was not reached for gastric cancer. It was not reached for small intestine cancer. And it was not reached for ovarian cancer. But in pancreatic cancer, it was four months. And in gliomas, it was 5.6 months. Opening the door for some very interesting um, hypothesis generating ideas here. So you have this group of tumors that respond exquisitely well to PD-1 blockade, where their median overall survival is not reached for the entire group. And then you have these tumor types, pancreatic cancers and gliomas, that respond poorly and have very short overall survival. So what's the difference there? The, because we believe the genetic makeup of both these tumors is equivalent. Could it be that the genetic makeup actually isn't equivalent? Could it be that the microenvironment's different? Could it be a drug or immune system penetration issue? Um, and so that's an outstanding question right now that has not been resolved, but it's something that I think that this data allows us to begin to explore that um, more closely.
And this is just a, a, a summary of the anti-tumor activity across tumor types. So what I've shown you in a snapshot was the evolution of this idea that began in the early 2010s, 2011s, clinical trial initiated in 2013, and the proof of principle studies were published in 2015. And since then, we've not only gotten approvals as a pan tumor classification uh, in any tumor type in adult or children uh, with mismatch pair deficiency, but we've also gotten a first line approval in colorectal cancer, and I suspect more will come, not only in first line colorectal cancer, but other first line scenarios. And we're starting to see this approach migrate into the adjuvant setting and into the neoadjuvant setting. There's a study here uh, led by Yelena Janjigian looking at the use of circulating tumor DNA in mismatch pair deficient adjuvant patients to see if anti-PD-1 can clear disease in the adjuvant setting. And there's another study by Andrea Sursek looking at the neoadjuvant application of PD-1 blockade. Um, so before surgery, radiation or chemotherapy in patients with rectal cancer that are mismatch pair deficient. So what is the potential impact of this approach? We know that about 4% of all cancer diagnoses are mismatch or pair deficient. That's about 40,000 new cases in the US per year, about 24,000 cases per year of stage four disease in the US and about half a million stage four cases globally. So tremendous impact here across multiple different tumor types. But what's going on in terms of a mechanism of action? And while I'm not gonna give you an answer here, I will give you the outline of what might be going on um, where further investigation might be, might be necessary. The first is the evolution of the clinical response of PD-1 blockade um, doesn't stop at 20 weeks, which is the data I, re I reported. It actually continues to evolve over time. And when we looked at our patients who achieved a response at 20 weeks, many of those went from a partial response at 20 weeks to a complete response at the best time point. In many who achieved stable disease converted to a partial response. So the evolution of the response continued. Now, was that active tumor killing or something else? Um, and when we did serial biopsies of these different tumor tissues, this is classically what we found. Pre-treatment, we saw a lymphocyte-rich tumor with mucin deposits. Post-treatment, we saw necrosis with still an inflammatory rim. And then eventually we saw scar with mucin deposits. So that was the classic evolution that we saw in patients who had tumor remaining. Because in order to do serial biopsies, there had to be something to biopsy. And because of the large number of patients either had a major response or a complete response, we weren't able, always able to biopsy these patients. And when we looked at paired pretreatment, post-treatment biopsies, 72% um, of 14 uh, partial responses or stable disease showed no evidence of malignancy at biopsy. Those patients did quite well, and that's shown here in the blue. Whereas those patients who had persistent tumor in the biopsy did quite poorly, suggesting to us that what we were seeing radiographically in a large fraction of the cases wasn't tumor, but was scar. And those patients who did score positive for tumor in the biopsy, most often had not completely cleared the tumor at the time of biopsy. And this was typically at, at between 14 and 20 weeks post-treatment that we were obtaining these biopsies. Now this excludes all the patients who had a major response where it was either a complete response or no tumor biopsy was uh, possible. The other thing that was pretty clear was both clinically and biochemically that the initial response of PD blockade was incredibly fast. And I don't think there has been another circulating biomarker test that has been able to show this type of data with this type of granularity. But one of the advantages of treating colorectal cancer is that these tumors secrete a protein biomarker called CEA. And we tracked it every two weeks with therapy. And what we were able to see was that tumors that were proficient progressed quite rapidly on anti-PD-1 therapy, whereas those that were deficient responded and showed normalization of this protein biomarker, representing an elimination of the tumor cell. 
And we saw that this occurred pretty quickly. As I mentioned before, clinically, we felt and the patient felt that they were doing much better after one or two doses. And so what was going on here? So we, we thought at this point, it, it might be interesting to look at the T cell response as measured by T cell receptor clonality in these tumors. Now, we're not trying to identify specific clones um, to necessarily test anything other than the kinetics of the response. And here, what we found was in the peripheral blood, in mononuclear cells in the peripheral blood versus PCR and out TCRs in the tumor tissue, we found clones that were present in both. And we could track these clones and we could show that pre-treatment, they were at baseline, but they would spike up after treatment and come back down. Now, that doesn't mean that what we're seeing go up and down are clones that are responsive to something going on in the tumor. It just means that anti-PD-1 unleash these, these T cells to proliferate. So what we had to do, and this is a second patient that showed a similar sort of response, that despite continuous treatment beyond 14 weeks, the spike in the T cells happened early on and resolved by 14 weeks or 12 weeks in the patient above. Uh, and these were T cell receptors that were also present in the tumor cell. Now we removed T cell receptors that were common to other well-known viruses like EBV, uh, that also showed a similar sort of kinetics. Um, but, so these are the ones that, that, that we think we thought were tumor specific. But to take it a step further, we exome sequence all these tumors. We actually made peptides to the sequences that most likely are bound with high computational affinity to the class one restriction of these patients. And then performed an assay called... Um, what did we call that assay? It, it, it's, a, it's an assay that we developed at Hopkins where we would spike the peripheral blood of the patient, create an LE spot response, and then sequence the T cell receptors of the T cells that responded to that uh, protein sequence that was related back to the mutation in the tumor tissue. Um, and what we found was when we did that, those T cell receptors that responded specifically to mutations corresponding to the sequence alterations in that tumor um, responded again in that same time frame, And you can see here in the red, uh, this patient's uh, tumor responded and by 22 weeks it went down to baseline. And these were patients that had achieved a near complete response in most cases. So most of the action is happening within the first 20 weeks of therapy. What happens after that, I'm not sure, but what I can tell you is that most clearance happens quite quickly in these tumors. The other thing that's quite interesting, and this is a, a study uh, conducted by Jinru uh, Shia that here at Memorial Sloan Kettering that was, I think, quite provocative and interesting. She found two things. One was when she looked at PDL1 expression on mismatch bird deficient tumors, very few of them had PDL1 on the surface of the tumors, but rather on the lymphocytic infiltrate. And this is consistent with studies that we found in our laboratory as well that PDL1 is typically not expressed on mismatch for deficient tumors, rather on the lymph lymphocytic infiltrate. Um, and furthermore, the PDL1 staining um, and the lymphocytic staining was in an immune exclusion pattern. So limited to this outside border and some occasional internal tumor pockets. So it wasn't what you typically see in melanoma or in lung cancer where an immune exclusion pattern was seen as a negative thing. In our case, it actually was the rule rather than the exception, and it corresponded both the patients that were responders and some non-responders. So it was more biology, a biological feature of the tumor type, mismatch rate deficient tumors, than anything associated with poor response. So that was a quite unique observation by Jinru here. Um, in addition to the fact that PDL1 tumors, or less than 2% of the mismatch deficient tumors, express PDL1 on the surface. The other one that's not surprising, uh, and this was in our original work, was the mutational burden was associated with efficacy. Um, on the left here, um, mismatch rate of proficient tumors and deficient tumors, you can see the massive difference in the number of mutations uh, per tumor, 1,700 versus 70. And when we looked at <clears throat> at the entire group together, the higher the mutational burden, the more likely the 
objective response versus stable disease versus progressive disease. And this was modeled um, in collaboration with Tim Chan, um, it, where he actually knocked out MSH2 um, in a colorectal cancer line. And what he saw, not surprisingly, was a tumor that went from mismatch proficient to deficient as it was passaged accumulated mutations over time. And these mutations weren't only SMVs, but they were novel indels that accumulated over time as well. And when that was then examined within the patients, both in our subset and a subset here from Morrison Kettering, the number of indel mutations correlated with response above and beyond that of just mutations of, in, of themselves, suggesting that the indels might be a driving feature for response in this tumor type. And this makes sense because, and this applies to virtually every aspect of cancer genomics, whether it's diagnostic or therapeutic, whether it's ther therapeutic uh, neoantigens or small molecules, gene amplifications are the least foreign. You're just amplifying the same sequence over and over again, and you may or may not get that protein that's overexpressed. Same with large lesions and point mutations. Point mutations rarely have a dramatic change uh, in the overall pro structure of the, uh, of the protein to the point where you, where you can find specificity in a large way. But when you start looking at indels, frame shifts, or even gene rearrangements, you develop novel proteins that actually appear foreign within the host. And those indels, those frame shifts, or those gene re rearrangements, not only are excellent targets diagnostically, because you can detect frame shifts and gene rearrangements more readily than point mutations, only because of the discrimination factor. They're also great targets <clears throat> for small molecules and they're fantastic neoantigens. So the more foreign you get, the more immunogenic you get. And this is one of the reasons I think mismatch for deficient tumors are much more potently immunogenic. The other reason is obviously just the mutational burden. Um, and this is something I've been showing for a while, but that mismatch for deficient colorectal cancer and prostate cancers, you almost get no responses at all. Um, and that's because the tumor mutational burden is quite low. On the other extreme, strong responders like mismatch for deficient tumors or other tumor types I haven't talked about, like pol e uh, or pol uh, e deficient or mutant tumors or biallelic mismatch for deficiency, they have tens of thousands of mutations at times, incredibly strong responders. And then you have mixed responders, melanomas, non-small cell lung cancers, where you have a robust response in a subset of patients, but more than half, oftentimes, you're not getting a substantial uh, response that's prolonged and you have a, a fairly intermediate progression-free survival. So one approach would be that in the strong responders, single agent therapy with checkpoint blockade is sufficient. You may need mixed therapy in these uh, intermediate groups. And then in the non-responders, they may not just be immunogenic. And converting them from non-immunogenic to immunogenic is going to take um, a significant effort. What else have we learned? Well, again, out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, when Tim Chan was here, he started looking at <clears throat> the prediction of HLA um, class and load tumor mutational load on the response of the checkpoint blockade. And what I can tell you as I sort through that data is that the hypothesis or the end result of this is that just maybe the amount of TMB with the diversity of HLA equals the amount of potential mutant associated new antigens. And what Tim found was that if you had an LOH event at a certain HLA, or if you had homozygosity at the HLA, so less diversity, less number of HLA, you have a worse clinical benefit to checkpoint blockade. Whereas if you had no LOH events and a high amount of diversity in the HLA, in patients that had a higher TMB, you had a more clinical benefit, more potential neoantigens. So we were interested in the influence of HLA, specific class one, in, uh, in our patients with mismatch barrier deficiency. Um, and this was really a study that was led and conceived of by Jacqueline Hetchman 
And what she found was quite striking. And this is something that we found mutationally as well, that patients that had biallelic or no expression of B2M, a molecule necessary for chaperoning of MHC class one to the surface of the tumor cell. <clears throat> and she corroborated this with MHC class one expression, still achieved a partial response um, to PD-1 blockade or PDL one blockade, suggesting that HLA was not required for the response to checkpoint inhibition in these mismatch break deficient tumors. And that this response was ongoing. It wasn't just a short-lived response. Um, we found something very similar that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, so the majority of patients with mismatch break deficient tumors are deficient in beta tumor globulin as a result of biallelic inactivation. Yet the majority still respond. Um, and this response appears to be durable. And she published this <clears throat> Uh, early last year, and other groups have corroborated on this as well. So just maybe B2M and class one isn't that important for mismatch for deficient tumor responses. What about primary and secondary resistance? So we've been looking at this for a number of years now. Um, and the first molecules or mutations that came out that might be associated with resistance to uh, primary resistance checkpoint blockade, again, this work was published by Anthony Rebus was mutations in JAK1 or JAK2 um, that would interfere with interferon gamma signaling or mutations in B2M. And so when we looked at our patients that were initially unresponsive to checkpoint blockade, um, we found the following. First of all, primary resistance was noted in 14% of our patients. TMB was not a factor. Mutational burdens were high in, in, in both groups and really not significant. Um, we found no beta-2 microglobulin mutations in the patients with primary resistance, and JAK1 and 2 mutations were found in both the responders and in the non-responders. <clears throat> One other question was, and remember from the beginning of the talk, do hereditary mutations make a difference? And while you see a trend for Lynch patients, hereditary tumors do a little bit worse, um, this was not significant, and the numbers are still small, but this is an open question. Uh, does a hereditary nature of this tumor do worse in the sporadic nature of these tumors. What about secondary resistance? And these are cases where the patient responds and then the tumor became resistant. And we only have five cases of acquired resistance and two cases <clears throat> were in the brain and one case was in the bone. And these are atypical sites for recurrence. Um, in, some in some circumstances that continued considered immune sanctuaries. Uh, and if we can hark back to the data showing no response rate in the brain, just maybe um, this plus that no res primary responses in the brain suggests that to in mismatch for deficient tumors, the brain may be a sanctuary for these tumor cells. Uh, and the bone is another site uh, that's quite interesting and we get one case there. All cases were treated with local therapy and continue to be alive and continue treatment with pembrolizumab. Um, so these escape lesions certainly didn't alter the clinical course of these patients. What's interesting is, is that we do, did find B2M mutations um, in both cases in the brain, uh, but we've still found no acquired mutations in JAK1 or JAK2. And this is just a schematic showing that there was really no shift in the number of mutations in the primary tumor or in the metastasis. Um, roughly the same amount of mutations, but there's quite a bit of remodeling that goes on between the primary and the subsequent met metastatic lesion. So we did a number of different investigations looking at virtually every published mutation that was associated with loss of uh, reported decline in clinical efficacy uh, to checkpoint inhibition, primarily in melanoma and lung cancer where most of the data sits. And we have really found no association with any current mutation to date. But, and this is unpublished data, one thing that we did begin to notice when we started looking at the data more carefully was could there be a difference in heterogeneity? And in the green are the patients who had significant clinical benefit, both in response rate and overall survival. And in the red are the patients who had poor responses to immune checkpoint inhibition. Um, and this isn't all the patients, this is a selection. So that's why you see almost an even distribution. And what this is are the mutational counts and the mutational allele frequency of each of these mutations. 
And what you start seeing is that the patients who have a very good response are shifted very left. And in many cases, this shifting left suggests that there is a high amount of diversity or subclinality in these tumors. Whereas in many of the patients who did poorly, you actually had very clonal events. And now all these are normalized for, for tumor content um, because obviously that can be an issue in measuring subclinality. And so this is just a, a hint of what we've been working on. But what we're finding is, is that in responders, they're incredibly subclonal. Whereas in non-responders are incredibly clonal. And that difference is significant, not only by responders and non-responders, but also because it's opposite the current dogma. The current dogma in melanoma and in lung cancer is the, clone, the tumor clones that are responsive to checkpoint blockade are clonal. And the more subclonal you get, the less clinical benefit you derive in those tumor types. Whereas in mismatch repair deficient tumors, the more subclonality you have, the better the response. And if you become clonal or are clonal from the onset, your clinical benefits low. So that dichotomy is very important to us. And I think uh, for us suggests a very different mechanism of action about how these cells are not only producing new antigens, but how um, the response to checkpoint and blockade occurs. So to summarize this work, and I just used melanoma because it's a very good canvas to compare against. Um, Mismatch per deficient tumors have a high mutational burden compared to melanoma, which have a high burden, but it's typically around 150 mutations per megabase. Mismatch per deficient tumors are frame shift abundant or indel abundant, which are much more foreign looking in terms of the final protein it, gen it generates uh, than other tumor types, whereas melanoma is frame shift poor, indel poor. The lymphocytic infiltrates immune exclusion versus intratumoral melanoma. pdl ones rarely on the tumor of a common on the melanoma surface. This is something we didn't get into, but genomes of mismatch rare deficient tumors are tend to be diploid, so not chromosomally unstable, whereas those in melanoma are quite aneuploid. B2M or class one dependency, no deficient tumors. Um, Long-term survivors are, are quite common. Um, and one thing we mentioned at the very end is, is the complexity, the diversity of mismatch deficient tumors that respond uh, are very subclonal, whereas melanomas that respond tend to be clonal. So where do we go from here? Well, we could stop here and say that this is a great biomarker for responsive PD-1 blockade. Um, we can continue to fine tune therapies and add new combinations in order to get an even higher response rate we can begin to move this therapy to the earlier lines of therapy um, to see if we have a better response either in the adjuvant setting or the new adjuvant setting. And those studies are ongoing. Um, but what else can we do with this information? So the question is, can we reprogram mismatch repair proficient tumors and turn them into the ones that are deficient? Um, and we have three, three, three of my colleagues here, my most of Catherine Benoit Rousseau, Matesh Patel and Chi Luo have taken on this project. Um, and this is a, a very tough project. The objective here is to turn mismatch paired proficient tumors into deficient tumors pharmacologically. And I'll just give you a hint of how we're approaching this. Um, we have begun with a drug screen using a syngenaic mouse model where we take mismatch paired proficient tumor cells, spike them with syngenaic splenocytes and achieve not only a baseline responsiveness with and without anti-PD-1, but then in a cohort of these cells, pharmacologically try to convert them from proficient to deficient using a variety of different approaches. So I'm not going to get into details of that, but I can tell you that we've had some interesting results so far. Uh, and this is work that was uh, really done by Benoit Rousseau uh, and Mitesh Patel. And um, here are the, the experiment. This is no PD-1, this is with anti-PD-1. This is the tumor cell with, uh, with uh, splenocytes uh, from the syngenaic mouse. And um, in the blue are the parental 
CT26s, so these are colon cancer cell line, spiked or co-cultured with an anti, um, with an, uh, co-cultured with asplenocytes alone. And then in red here is uh, that same CT26 parental line with knocked out with MSH2. And again, co-cultured with asplenocytes. And then in purple and in green, is co-cultured with two drugs um, for eight weeks that at least genetically are converting these tumor cells from a proficient genotype to a deficient genotype. And what we're showing here is, is when we add anti-PD-1 to that same cocktail here, that you're seeing no response <clears throat> with the parental line alone. In the red, you see an initial response with the mismatch per deficient line that was knocked out. But in the, in the tumor cells that were treated pharmacologically with the drug trying to establish mismatch repair, we see an incredible amount of apoptosis in those cells that occurs over time. So we've transformed these non-immunogenetic cells, as you can see in the blue, into the ones that are immunogenic um, using a drug and a drug combination that we think uh, will reproduce something that we see in mismatch repair deficient tumors or even better. So where does this go from here? So we have a number of cocktails that we're trying. The real question for us is, can we do this in vivo without turning all the cells in the body into mismatch bare deficient cells? Uh, because obviously that would be a situation where they would all become subject to the immune response uh, by anti-PD-1. <clears throat> but what was interesting is, is when we look back at data from con constitutional mismatch repair. So these are children born with both alleles of a mismatch repair deficient protein, a mismatch repair protein lost from birth. That these patients develop tumors that are mismatch repair profic deficient very early in their life. But if you look at their bone marrow, or if you look at their skin, or if you look at their GI tract, they're not mismatch pair deficient in those tumors, at least functionally. There's no evidence of MSI in those tumors, in those normal tissues. It's only left in the tumor tissue alone. Suggesting to us that a pharmacological approach, normal cells may be protected uh, in a way that, uh, that um, tumor cells are more susceptible to. And that's something we'll be exploring next. So in conclusion, Pembrolizumab continues to provide robust anti-tumor activity with durable responses in patients with mismatch for deficient tumors, independent of tumor type. The safety profile, which I didn't discuss, is consistent uh, with previously observed patients with advanced cell tumors. Um, things of interest, mismatch for deficient tumors show this immune exclusion pattern. And pdl ones predominantly expressed on lymphocytes and not on the tumor. B2M and HLA is not required for responses to pd one blockade. And I think the genomics, and this still has to be firmly proven, of these mutations, indels drives a clinical response to anti-PD-1. And from my perspective, the future really is harnessing this knowledge and moving it to patients that are mismatch pair proficient and trying to create a new genotype that's actually immunogenic. So a lot of this work was uh, initiated at the Ludwig Center of Cancer Genetics and Therapeutics at, uh, at Johns Hopkins. I have to thank Swim Across America because they funded the initial uh, clinical trials associated with this uh, when no one else would fund this. Um, obviously, members of the Stand Up to Cancer, Kayvon included, uh, who is the host today. Uh, acknowledgements to the members who completed a lot of the clinical trials, and especially Young Lee, because uh, when I was recruiting a, uh, a clinical investigator to help me with this clinical trial, uh, she was the one that raised her hand and said yes. Um, and so I'm glad it worked out for her and for the study and for the patients. And then my new lab here, Memorial Stone Kettering, that is working on projects that are, uh, are highly ambitious and can be frustrating, but I think in the end will bear some fruit. And before I stop, I will always want to thank uh, Henry Lynch. He passed away last year, uh, but he was instrumental in developing the theory of genetically based cancers, and he was the first to describe Lynch syndrome. Uh, and that description has uh, carried his, this way uh, all the way to here, and um, it's, uh, it's an honor to have uh, worked on the tumors that he first described. So thank you very much, and I'll stop there. Thanks, Luis, that was great. Um, I think you have the QA slide up, so 
uh, for those uh, watching, please uh, send your questions to OSET at MSKCC or tweet at MSK Education, and we'll try to get to those uh, as we go uh, forward. So uh, thanks so much, Luis, for presenting. We want to just uh, start with a few kind of fundamental questions um, that are coming in. So I'm going to try to kind of organize them into one. So one general question is, you know, you, you highlighted that a number of things in mismatch repair tumors you know, are kind of different from those in melanoma. What do you think drives response? Is it more so, you know, indels and the number of mutations, or is it lack of PDL1 expression on the tumor? I mean, what, what do you think actually more drives the response, or is it just unknown, like, to what degree those each play a role? So as someone that was trained in a cancer genetics lab, I think that that the response to checkpoint inhibitions is tumor intrinsic. So the foreignness of the cell, of the tumor cell, drives a response. And the only reason they're not cleared um, is that they overexpress PDL1. And not the tumor in this case, but the micro environment around it. And there might be something too that the intensity of the foreignness of these tumors may drive PDL1 overexpression in the periphery. Um, and the periphery being the invasive front of the tumor. Um, and that's where the action's happening. So the tumor is actually, when you add anti PD1, it's being destroyed from the outside in. But, but that's fundamentally what I believe. I think there needs to be more data to show that. Um, but I believe that the indels, uh, and specifically the subset of indels called frame shifts are the ones that drive the immune response or the immunogenicity of these tumor cells. What I don't think we understand is, 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 are two things. Why PDL1 isn't overexpressed in the tumor cell um, and why aren't those, then therefore why aren't those tumors cleared? Right. And why can PDL1 just express on that periphery be enough? Um, so it might be that the cells uh, capture some other form of uh, immune suppression that we don't fully understand yet. It's like almost like an outside shield yeah. tumor that doesn't let these lymphocytes in. I mean, it, with that in mind, do you think there's a threshold for indels? Meaning like, it looks like it's an order of magnitude, like thousand versus a hundred. You take, yeah, so if you look at- If you look at- like minimum, minimum, you think that you need that? I'm just thinking right in the context of your kind of drug-induced mismatch, yeah. mismatch so, repair. Like how much do you need to convert tumor to something that might respond? Well, it's not just the number of mutations, although I do think that's a factor. <clears throat> if you treat with temozolomide, with, which is a very potent mutagen, if you sequence tumors that were treated with temozolomide after they've been treated for eight weeks, you'll have a lot of mutations of that tumor. There have been studies now, two published, that show that those don't respond to anti-PD-1. So it's not just the sheer number of mutations, it's the type of mutations mm -hmm. that you induce um, and that's another point that leads me towards the frame shift or the indel hypothesis. Um, but th there are two other scenarios that happen in nature where the tumors have even an order of magnitude higher mutations than a mismatch for deficiency. That's pol E and pol D mutant tumors, uh, where they tend to have between two and 4,000 mutations for coding exome or the constitutional mismatch for deficient tumors they have about 20,000 mutations for coding exome. Um, and you'd think that they would respond much better and, and they respond very well. Um, but I would always believe that those tumors would just apoptose because you can't survive right. with that many mutations. Um, but there tends to be a plateau as to where, where this will work. I see. So in the setting, so now kind of like a different question. So in your series of MSI high, MSI high uh, tumors, do they correlate with, you know, FTG PET positivity? Meaning that like, do the ones that, is there like a relationship between kind of metabolic status, for example, in glycolysis and response? And do you think there's a metabolic reason for, you know, lymphocytes being excluded from the tumor? Maybe they can't get in because there's a tumor yeah, yeah. environment reason. We haven't necessarily, we've never looked at that, uh, but that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think the, 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 probably the reason we haven't gone down that path is 
to us, immune exclusion is not bad, right? It's these right. patients do fine. So, um, so, but it, but it's an inter interesting question. And, and we've kind of shied away from the metabolic sort of approach with these tumor types because they don't have canonical uh, pathways mutated necessarily that are associated with, uh, with the classical metabolic abnormalities like glucose processing and so forth. But one must assume that they do. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I guess fidelity for T cells, it might be that T cells are getting to the tumor, maybe they're infiltrated, but they're exhausted or not able to perform clearing function that you would expect for them to go. So I, mean, I think they're possibly- Yeah, but if they were exhausted, why, adding anti-PD-1 wouldn't work. Right. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, so, so I don't think they're exhausted. I don't think they're metabolically impaired. Um, that whole line of, of reasoning, I, I still have to be convinced of. Um, so you're in the camp that they're just not recognizing the tumor as tumor to clear it. No, I think they're very obedient to checkpoints. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're just waiting, they're waiting for check, checkpoint uh, inhibition. So do you think then, kind of taking that further, do you think that tumors which currently are mismatch repair proficient, if you convert them, so this is now the class, it's not endometrials, maybe not, you know, not colon as right. much, um, that you can use, let's say, number of frame shift mutations as a threshold. Like, let's say I need this many frame shift mutations once I convert it, then now it will, it will respond and I don't need to worry about, you know, that's really the driver. So I just need like a good biomarker of like number of indels and I've developed a drug and I can, um, I can convert those. Is that kind yeah, of- so, So let's say you develop, you, you induce one good frame shift. Um, you won't induce that one good frame shift in every tumor cell. Sure. So e even if you get a partial radiographic response, um, that tumor is gonna come roaring back. Uh, so the durability response in mismatch repair deficient tumors is something to behold because that's very atypical uh, that, because it overcomes that, a heterogeneity issue. Would you think that maybe like a sledgehammer approach for like inducing mutations like radiation, like combined local high dose like radiation? I, I don't think it, I don't, I think what you're, there's a number of studies that are treating with uh, Y90 or with, yeah. uh, or with stereotactic radiation. And I, I think you're just non-specifically inducing danger signals. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe interferon gamma release, maybe creating some uh, foreign looking peptides and you're inducing almost an IVIG response in the tumor. Um, and, uh, and then the tumor grows back. I would, I would bet a lot of money that, the, that none of those will show durable response. And with radiation, um, I'm not sure those induce the right type of mutations. Most of those are still SMVs. So the, it's clear that you you need these frame shifts. Kind of uh, like frame I, shift. I think so, but we you know we still have to prove it. You know. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, yeah. it's interesting. I think it's provocative to like yeah. really bring it down from like just like thousands of mutations to like a specific subset of mutations of a given type and say, you know, like this would. Yeah. No, I, I think that that's you know that's obviously an interest of ours, and I hope that 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 works out. Yeah. So. You um, look, you know, in the setting of primary resistance, you show that mutational burden is slightly lower in uh, your non-responder group than in your responder group. Is that significant? And so it wasn't statistically significant. Okay. So it's yeah. more like a trend. It's not something that actually has. Yeah. yeah. But good, maybe pan or more patients and something that you, right. you could. You know, there's a, recent, there, there's a recent FDA approval using 10 mutations for megabase. Um, as the cutoff, and they achieve uh, a decent response rate, um, but there's no survival benefit. And um, I think that 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 speaks to again the nature of the mutations. You might you might get a better response um, that's cosmetic, but the overall survival will be unchanged. So, like, what kind of one? This begs kind of like a general question, maybe a naive one, which is. So non kind of non-invasive circulating tumor cells or whatever sampling gives you an idea of some population of tumors, let's say in, a in the setting of a metastatic patient, many lesions. Mm 
when you treat, and let's say you're treating as a function of, let's say, high mutational burden, mismatch repair deficient high mutational burden, and you clear those, like you select for those, do you see a situation where you then, you just, select those, those get cleared, and a subpopulation of heterogeneous kind of these tumors evolve that maybe are either mismatch repair proficient, like they convert, or you select for those, or ones with just less mutational burden. Does that happen? Do you, yeah. So do you convert yeah, as a, does a patient convert over time? And so the ones that don't survive or I was, that would have been the most beautiful story, right? So in these, in these, medicine, in these, in these, in these, in these cases where they had, they, where they had uh, recurrence, right. Or resistance. So they responded to therapy, but then they became resistant. We took those tumors and sequenced them. And my dream was that they'd have no mutations, right? Like 70 mutations but they had the same number of mutations. And now the mutations were very different. So, uh, you know, I, I've been against the microenvironment for a while. I've been very tumor intrinsic, but I do think there's something different about the brain, bone, and pancreas, because we're not seeing great responses in those three sites. And that's where we see recurrences. Um, so there might be something unique about those microenvironments. It might be metabolic, Sure. It might be the composition of that microenvironment. It might, that, that, uh, that microenvironment might be more myeloid. Um, yeah, well, bone marrow, I mean, it has a kind of strength, like kind of a rationale. Yeah. So it, it's not, so again, I guess it's not obvious that you select, but is it possible that if you could assess that heterogeneity, and again, like, I don't know if you see this, like, do you actually, if you sample many tumors, let's say in a patient, let's say you biopsy more than one, is it the case that you see a patient with both, some lesions which are, you know, mismatch repair deficient and some which are proficient, or some with high mutational burden and some with low mutational burden? Like, does that happen? So is it just usually you there are there, there are case reports of that, yeah. uh, but it's definitely not the norm. Um, and certainly when we biopsied patients with more than one site, all of them had, had a high mutational burden. Mm -hmm. Now, what's fascinating is that they're not always, there's not a lot of overlap between the mutations, suggesting that there's right. continued evolution that happens independent of the primary seeding. So then does that argue that you should wait longer to mm -hmm. treat these people? Like, so that they develop more and more and more, <clears throat> and they'll respond better than if you kind of arguing against your new adjuvant story that like if i just like hit them with everything before create a super evolved mutationally high tumor in a mismatch de mismatch repair deficient person that they'll actually get a more durable response when i hit them later so i didn't i didn't pause on this point but in patients with distant metastases mm -hmm. they did better than patients with localized metastases so you know speaking to your point right. that said neoadjuvant applications of checkpoint blockade in, in lung cancer uh, and in, in breast cancer and what I've seen so far in rectal cancer, um, we're seeing amazing responses uh, mm -hmm. in these neoadjuvant settings. I, I suspect by the time that a tumor's a billion cells, you've got enough. And okay. enough mutations there. But so that, that argues for maybe like a size Required uh, if you have a fast growing, yeah, but but well, if you see it, if you see it on scan, okay. you know, a centimeter is going to be about a billion. Is enough. Yeah. yeah, no, that makes that makes sense. Yeah. So maybe one last question: Do you think yeah, that TMB is a major reason for resistance to checkpoint therapy? You mean low TMB? Yeah. Oh yeah. As a driver. Well, I I think it's a little different. You can have a low TMB tumor that has an immunogenic mutation, and that tumor might respond. I don't know how long it will respond for, but it might respond. Um, I think immunogenicity of the tumor has, has more to do with, uh, with it than just TMB alone. Interesting. Like the, okay, I'll one more. I'll just do one more. So have you also looked at the cancer cell fraction of indels to see if that's indicative of responses, like what that fraction of indels are. Yeah, so if, if you take total mutations and the denominator and indels on the numerator, 
there is a, there is a correlation with response rate uh, and indels. Interesting. Awesome. Thanks so much. Please. All right. Thank you, Kayvon. We'll, we'll stop uh, uh, <laughs> hounding you with the questions, but there are definitely more coming in, and, and we can uh, try to forward those to you. So hopefully you can get to those later. Um, I just wanted to thank you for presenting and also for everybody joining us today. Uh, our next seminar is happening on Monday, July 27th. We are pleased to welcome uh, the Chair of our Immunology Program, Dr. Alexander Rudinsky, who will talk uh, about a cell intrinsic mechanism for limiting immunity and inflammation. And so we look forward to that and thanks everyone.